Okay, so um, first question I always ask is, who, who's heard of Loughborough University? That's the response I normally get. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. That's the response I normally get. Okay, so we are um, 100 miles north of London, based in the UK Midlands. We are the largest single-site campus in the UK, occupying 437 acres. We've recently expanded that because we're, we're um, uh, working more closely with commercial businesses who are opening up enterprise offices um, adjacent, to, adjacent to the main campus. Quite a green campus. Uh, you can see these green areas here. We do a lot of sporting activity at Loughborough, so we're famous for our for our sporting education and our sporting facilities. Uh, Team GB were based on our campus. So as well as engineering, we've got a lot of sport, sports research going on. Um, we were formed as a technical institute in 1909, receiving our Royal Charter in 1966. We now comprise 10 schools with um, nearly 14,000 students, of which almost 3,000 of those are international from over 100 countries around the world. And civil engineering was founded in 1911. Civil engineering became civil and building engineering. This is the school um, in which I work. We've got uh, civil engineering, uh, structures, water engineering, geotechnics, that sort of thing, and built environment and transport studies. I'm based in the, in the built environment, and I'm a part of this building energy research group here. We've got 10 academic members of staff, three admin staff, 25 researchers comprising research assistants and PhD students. Um, we run various research centers out from, from this school. So it's, the, it's the largest of the 10 schools at Tullaby University. <coughs> Okay, so what do I want to talk about today? Um, I'll split the presentation into two, my consultancy activities and my research activities. Now what uh, people sometimes think of it, it is research that's done in uh, universities finding its way out into practice and being applied into practice. I want to present it slightly the other way around, because I think that's more interesting. So I'm going to talk about my consultancy activities, the real building design work, because I want to talk about how what we've discovered, what we've learned about real building, uh, real building design has then had an impact on the sort of research that we're doing. Okay. So the sort of consultancy projects I want to talk about, I want to talk about something called AMB buildings, advanced naturally ventilated buildings, and hybrid, hybrid ventilation solutions. I'm going to talk about the design challenges, how we responded to those, how we've used computer simulation, for these building designs, a little bit about commissioning, performance in use, and then the lessons we've learned. Quite happy to take questions for clarification as we go along, and then as, as Jake says, I'm going to be around for a while afterwards to, to continue any conversations. Okay, so what do I mean by an A&B building? Um, well, an advanced naturally ventilated building um, often comprises buoyancy driven natural ventilation. Um, so a little bit of theory about what that is. And it, really this theory, this idea of buoyancy driven naturally, uh, uh, natural ventilation underpins um, almost all of the designs I've been involved with. Certainly the designs I'm going to be talking about today. So the fabric and the form and the operation and the commissioning is all wrapped around, wrapped around this theory here, including the problems we get. So buoyancy driven natural ventilation, then warm air rises, each of us is giving up about 70 watts, that warm air rises, and it will find its way out of the building through any openings at high level, whether they be uh, gaps in the construction and the fabric of the building, or whether they be purpose provided controlled ventilation openings. So that warm stale air will flow out of the building, as it does, it will suck in fresh air at low level. And the reason it does that is because um, pressure increases with, with, um, with height. Um, so the more air we've got above us, the heavier the air, and therefore the greater the pressure that's acting at a height. But if we vary the temperature of that air, then the variation of the pressure changes. So the blue line over here is the pressure variation outside, and the orange line is the pressure variation inside. 
So the same sort of pressure gradient, but it varies at a different rate. What that does is it gives rise to these pressure differences. So these green arrows here represent pressure differences between the inside and the outside. And that's what drives that flow. Two points to note, they're very small driving pressures. So over a three-story building, these driving pressures might be anything between one and three pascals, whereas a, fat, a mechanical driven system is going to drive 30, uh, 30 or 40 pascals. So very, very small driving forces leading to larger, larger openings. The other thing to point out is these two graphs will cross over at some point called the neutral pressure level. And at that point, there's no flow in or out of the building. So if we make an opening, if we put a window at this height there, it will do very little in terms of, in terms of ventilation. So that all sounds a bit theoretical, but what happens in practice is we have to make sure that we get that level higher than all of the inlets and lower than all of the outlets. So we've got to size our ventilation openings to position that neutral pressure level in the right place. So we can control that based on how we design the, how we design the natural ventilation system. I'll come back to that uh, in a practical example a bit later on and show you how it, how it plays out and how it can cause a problem. Okay, so a little bit more about A and B buildings. So the, the way I describe this is A and B building is more than just um, building ventilation. It's more than just ventilating your uh, bedroom, if you like. Um, a and B buildings have a building management system. They'll often have cross ventilation from one side to another, and there may be stacks on the ventil uh, vertical ventilation stacks on the opposite side of that occupied space. So there'll be low-level inlets, high-level outlets to give us that buoyancy um, uh, driving pressure. Um, al almost certainly there'll be exposed thermal mass with nighttime ventilation for cooling down that mass, solar protection and daylighting. So it's not, it's not just about opening a window and allowing fresh air to come in from outside. The strategy won't work if we do that because natural ventilation can't cope with, with, with extremes of, of temperatures. If we integrate natural ventilation with exposed thermal mass, control, solar protection, and daylight, like we've got in here, then natural ventilation can be applied to a much wider um, range of, of, um, of, uh, of applications and, and climates. So what this enables us to do is to design for deeper plans, to partition the space up, and I'll show you how we've done that in some of the examples, and to provide passive cooling under warming conditions. Um, and again, I'll show you some examples of, of what I mean by that. So the first building I want to uh, talk about is Coventry University Library. This one's in the UK, in the UK Midlands, and was completed in the year 2000. You might be thinking, 13 years ago, this is old hat. Why is he talking about something that's so old? Um, and a number of times I've mentioned to uh, people who've, who've invited me to talk, I've said, I, I think it's time I stopped talking about Coventry University Live because that's quite an old building. Said, no, no, this is a really successful building. It works really well. It's still one of the largest naturally ventilated buildings in the world, as far as I know. It certainly was when it was, when it was built. And it is a very, very successful low energy building. And I'll explain why as we, as we go through. So it's a, this is a library with, with uh, 120,000 square feet of accommodation. The client wanted it to be energy efficient and environmentally friendly. So this was being designed in the mid 90s where it was a little bit of a new idea to want to design low energy buildings. And you know, the idea of sustainability was quite a new wacky idea. But the, the, the point here is the client, the client came to us and they wanted the, the, the energy credentials for this building. They wanted us to consider natural ventilation and daylighting and they wanted us to carry out computer modeling to predict the running costs, i.e. the energy performance of the building. So 
but it was all still quite new. So for a client to to ask us to uh, to do that as part of the brief was was uh, quite unusual. Um, just picking up the highlights here, they wanted the design to be robust to future increases in computer use, so they were worried about increased heat gain. What happened there was um, we moved from CRT monitors to flat screen technology, so actually the heat gain reduced. So that was no longer a problem for us. What we were a bit worried about was the driving force got reduced. <laughs> because the heat output was reduced, so we were worried about whether we could drive enough, enough ventilation flow. So some real interesting points of development there. We couldn't exceed four storeys uh, because of the local authority planning restrictions. Um, they wanted the internal layout to be simple and understandable. Control of external and internal noise was essential. There's a raised ring road just outside, so, so it became important to, to, um, to provide some control for that. So opening windows on the perimeter was, was a no-no, really. We had to think of an alternative way of, of designing the natural ventilation strategy. Um, so the brief was uh, consistent with sustainable building design, but had several fundamental design challenges. We had that elevated ring road just outside the building. Uh, we had what we would call a polluted site because we're in a city centre, an urban location with, with a raised ring road nearby. We had a very constrained site, and so we had to get this 120,000 square feet over a maximum of four storeys. So immediately, this was going to be a deep plan building. Okay, and the question is, how do you naturally ventilate? How do you provide daylight into a deep plan, into a deep plan building? Security is important. Was important. Um, apparently, students have a habit of throwing books out of windows. So opening windows on the building perimeter was not an option for us. Um, so the traditional approach of opening windows on the elevation and allowing fresh air to wash across the space was not was not a viable option. Uh, potentially high heat gains and they wanted a flagship building. So here's here's what the team uh, came up with and I just um, give acknowledgement to the architect Short and Associates here. So this is a typical floor layout which was 50 meters by 50 meters, um, punctured by five light wells. So we've got a central light well here, um, a light well in each of the um, four corners, four quadrants of the floor plan, and then um, about uh, 12 ventilation stacks marked in orange all the way around the outside of the around the outside of the building plan. So. Um, very deep plan building, but we're providing uh, pr uh, provision of daylight through these, through these light wells. These light wells are also providing us with our ventilation strategy. Um, what we can do with this sort of approach is, so here's our, here's our supply light well. I'll show this in section on the next slide and you'll get this, a clearer, clearer view of this. Here's our supply light well. What we've done here is to bolt on a seminar room to that supply light well. So we've got um, a partition seminar room which has its own dedicated supply of fresh air and its dedicated exhausts. Okay, so this has offered us uh, flexibility in terms of in terms of floor layout. Let's have a look at this in, in section then. I always talk about the outflow first because if you remember from my earlier slide, it's the air leaving the space that drives this flow. Buoyancy driven natural ventilation is not air coming in and pushing stale air out. It's air leaving the building, sucking fresh air in. That's how this ventilation flow works. So looking at the outlet paths first, warm air rises and we get a layer of warm air, ideally above head heights. So we've got very prodigious floor to ceiling heights here of, of four meters, very high, uh, very high ceilings, providing scope for that warm layer to develop below the ceiling. 
castellated beams here with holes in them enable that warm air to move across the, across the ceiling and to find its way to the outlet paths. Here is the central light well providing the outlet path um, in, in the center of the building and then all the way around the outside we've got these dedicated uh, ventilation stacks which are, which are taking the stale air up, up and out. Um, a bit more information on the environmental features here. So uh, up here on the top of the roof, these ventilation stacks have got wind protection, whereby um, rather than simply have a hole, we protect that hole by having semicircular um, is it aluminum or steel? Anyway, semicircular metal um, uh, devices for stopping the wind driving down into the into the ventilation. Uh, stack so the, the warm air flows up and out and finds its way around these semicircular cups and the wind isn't able to drive down into the into the ventilation stack. I talked about the low driving pressures uh, of buoyancy driven natural ventilation. Wind is a threat to that. So in this particular design we've designed the wind out of the out of the solution and we use just buoyancy to drive the flow. These U values, which are the reciprocal of the R value that you use, are much better than the current building regulations at the time. So about 500 mil of insulation on the top of the on the top of this building. So we were exceeding the current building regulations by some way. So that's just a part of the context. Uh, we weren't designing a business as usual building here. We were designing something that was that was quite special. Um, double glazing with argon fill and a low emissivity coating was something that was, was uh, kind of five, about five years ahead of its time. Firmly massive exposed concrete ceilings painted white to assist the daylight penetration into the deep plan and of course nighttime ventilation is able to flow along that ceiling through the castellated beams to cool down that fabric in preparation for uh, occupation in the following day. Inlet then, so the warm stale air flows up and out and as it does so it sucks in fresh air at low level. Uh, so here are two of the corner light wells uh, providing fresh air onto the floor plates and these are fed from below by these uh, concrete cleaner here and here uh, which then are linked to outside. So we're not we're protecting the inside from the noise of the raised ring road. A lot of the particulate matter that's in the air as it flows through here will drop out into the plenum. So we're protecting the inside from, from, from particulate pollution coming in from the, from the ring road. Moving translucent blinds um, at the uh, top of the light wells here. What this does is it protects the, the um, inside of the space from direct sun gain. As I said earlier, what we want to do is to provide as much help for the natural ventilation system as possible. So we want to reduce the internal heat gains as much as possible. Um, these blinds enable us to provide daylight, a little bit like the translucent devices up there. They provide daylight, but they reduce the solar gain. We don't want solar gain in these buildings. We want daylight in these buildings. Okay. Um, we were a bit worried about the uh, top of the light well heating up here due to solar gain and therefore pre-warming incoming air. So this little greenhouse area on the top here um, then has windows on two sides which open up and then the warm air is able to be uh, passively vented away and, and reduce any preheating, any undesirable preheating of the, of the air. Okay. Um, so a bit on the computer simulation then. At the time of doing this, um, it wasn't possible to model um, the whole of the building with the computer hardware we had. So what we've got here is one quadrant of the building. So you imagine that this here is the central light well, uh, a, quarter, a quarter of the central light well. Here is one of the uh, quadrant light wells which is providing fresh air into the space. So this. This is a lovely warm summer day in the UK at 24 and a half degrees C um, and um, have our heat gains distributed across, evenly distributed across each floor here, ground as we call it, ground floor, first floor, second floor 
and then and then the third floor. And we sized the openings according to the stack force that was acting at that height. So remember those graphs I showed earlier on. The, the difference between the two graphs increases as you move away from the neutral pressure level. Essentially what that means is we've got a greater driving force on the ground floor relative to the top floor. So these openings down here don't need to be as big as the openings up on the top floor. And we size the openings mathematically based on that to try and get the same flow rate through, through each floor. We noticed a problem on the top floor here. Um, hard to see in this light, but that's slightly warmer than the, than the lower floors. If we look a bit uh, closer at that, we can see that in fact there is backflow from the central light well onto the top floor. And that is, that is an example of what can happen if you get the open size wrong or if you get the, the, if there is insufficient height above the uppermost opening um, such that the neutral pressure level, that's this point here, falls, falls below this opening. And that's what's happened here. So in this design, because there wasn't enough height above the, above the roof here, because of the height restrictions for this building, the neutral pressure level had dropped to somewhere in this region here so that there was backflow onto the, onto the top floor. This was solved by sealing the top floor from the, from the central light well and adding a dedicated exhaust stack to that, to that floor. So it was nice for me to, to, after having done the computer simulations, to identify this problem and then uh, uh, to actually um, have, have an impact on the, on the design and construction of the building in that, in that way. Measure performance, um, okay, so we had a heat wave in 2004 when the temperature went up to 30 degrees C, it's about 90 degrees F, and um, that's what I've plotted here, so we've got some days in July and August. Um, the uh, yellow is the outside temperature, and the two blue lines are, um, I think it's uh, two sensors on the second floor. The guidance we were working to at the time said, we shouldn't exceed 77 degrees F for more than 5% of the occupied hours, and we shouldn't exceed 82 degrees F for any more than 1% of the occupied hours. So during this heat wave summer of uh, 2004, 25 degrees C, 77 F was exceeded for less than 1% of the hours, and 82 was never exceeded. So we were very pleased with that. Just to zoom in here a little bit, give you a little bit more detail. So here's the outside temperature bouncing up and down, and um, the internal, these blues here. So two things are happening here. First of all, clearly, the peak indoor temperature is not as high as the peak outdoor temperature. I talked about um, ANV buildings at the beginning, and it's more than just opening windows. If you just open the window, the temperature you get inside is pretty much the temperature you've got outside. So if it's 30 degrees outside, simply opening the window isn't going to deliver you the passive cooling you need. So because we um, have got um, a thermal mass in this building and nighttime ventilation, and we're controlling the openings so that we don't flood the building too quickly with outside air when it gets really warm, we're able to reduce that peak temperature. But the other thing that's happened, which is which is uh, harder to see, is there's a slight time lag in that peak. So the peak temperature, although the peak temperature outside might occur at about 2 p.m. in the afternoon, whereas the peak temperature inside may be delayed by, say, two hours, three hours. So the peak temperature inside occurs maybe four or five o'clock. People are going home. So that's a helpful, helpful um, phenomena that's uh, going on there. At the end of that case study, I want to move on to um, a building we designed just outside of Chicago, um, um, an architecture, um, architectural design center at Judson uh, University in Illinois. Um, as I say, 40 miles northwest of Chicago and the banks of the Fox River, a 1,200 student college. 
client wanted um, a library with workspace for 150 academics, 15 staff, a computing area, and um, staff in, in, in uh, cellular accommodation. When we set about designing any building, the first thing we look at is the, is the client of data. And we can get a lot from that, as I'm sure many of you, many of you know. Um, I plotted the, I plotted an, an ASHRAE comfort envelope onto this psychrometric chart here. Um, so I, I'm not sure how you are, uh, how you normally look at the psychrometric chart. There are various ways of presenting it. What I've got here is dry bulb temperature across the bottom, and then the moisture content up on the right hand side, just to give you an orientation. So. Looking at this climatic data for Chicago, we'll, we can see that there's um, okay some hours up here whereby it's impossible to get into the comfort envelope without providing some mechanical, some mechanical cooling and dehumidification. Similarly, in the middle of winter in Chicago, when the air comes in from the east, the, the air down here is so skin-crackingly dry that if we were to heat it up, it would be so dry and have problems with, with um, dry lips, dry eyes, and all the rest of it. So there's humidification and heating needed down here, and there's dehumidification and cooling needed up here. But there's a whole raft of hours where a passive, a passive solution is likely to work. So all of these hours here, we simply move these to the right by introducing them into the building. They'll pick up some of the heat inside the building, and then they'll they'll move into the, into the comfort envelope. Um, so that's the strategy that we've got for this building. This is a, um, a mixed mode solution, a hybrid, um, hybrid solution. So what we've got here, section through the building, um, works very similar in passive mode to the Coventry University Library. We've got a central light well here, which in this case is supplying fresh air, fed below by these cleaner, a bit like uh, Coventry, and then the stacks on the top of the building, which enable the warm, stale air to flow up and out. But in addition, we've got a mechanical system that runs in parallel to this. So when we move into those extreme temperatures, um, middle of the summer, middle of the winter, then we'll close down uh, these ventilation stacks on, on the top of the building, and we will duct air, stale air, um, through the return duct on the outside of the building here and bring it down into an AHU at the bottom where some of it will be expelled and, and some of it will be, so will be recirculated. So we've got a full uh, mechanical ventilation and cooling system running in parallel, well, running um, at the time of the year when the passive system, when the passive system doesn't work. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of features here because I'm going to come back to them when I talk about the commissioning. So the idea was to harness the wind forces as well as the buoyancy forces in this building. So um, the idea was to open, uh, um, close down the windward dampers and open the leeward dampers and that would assist the ventilation. Um, and down here in the plenum it was important that the, the uh, dampers were airtight because, as I say, small driving forces. So when we're in natural ventilation mode, we've got very large openings. So what you want to make sure of is when you, when you switch over from passive mode to mechanical mode, when you're filling this plenum up with mechanically cooled air, you don't want that leaking out through the dampers. So very important that that's airtight at that location. So these are just some of the some of the elements of the design and commissioning that were certainly different to to a business as usual. Back to computer simulation then, um, and the use of computational fluid dynamics. So looking at a section of this building here, um, what we were doing here was to test the opening sizes, make sure that they were they were large enough when operating in the natural ventilation mode. We're looking at the draft analysis and the, and the comfort of, of, of the air speeds around the occupant's ankles, um, and look at the temperature distribution. 
Again, we sized these openings according to the stack driving pressure that was acting at any, at any height. We've got some problems here whereby the openings aren't large enough. I think there was um, a lot of computers in this space here, so we need to treat that separately. Um, but uh, generally, we were, um, when the outside air temperature was at 70 degrees F, we were able to drive naturally six air changes per hour, which is quite you know, typical for a natural ventilation strategy, and to generate a delta T, an inside-outside temperature difference of, of three degrees, which is, again, what we try to achieve in, um, in naturally, naturally ventilated buildings. So we were quite satisfied that the buoyancy-driven natural ventilation mode was working in this case. Would like it, it is likely to work. Um, the predicted performance then, so just comparing with, with ASHRAE benchmarks here for two different set points, 24 degrees C and 26 degrees C. So we've got, here we've got, um, in this benchmark, we've got the mechanical ventilation and heating here, and then we've got the mechanical ventilation and cooling here. The object, the object of this design was to put a dent in those two chunks of energy use by applying uh, passive ventilation and heating, which is this pink one here in the, in the winter time, and, passive, vent and uh, passive ventilation without any mechanical cooling, so passive ventilation and cooling, sorry, in the, in, in the summertime. And the computer simulations that we undertook, the dynamic thermal simulations we undertook, predicted that we could displace about 50% of this mechanical energy with, with um, with the passive measures. How does it reduce the heating then? Okay. It reduces the heating energy by um, having a more airtight building, uh, more insulation, and solar shape, uh, heating, sorry, um, more insulation, a more airtight building, and tighter control over the over the, over the dampers, essentially. Yeah. So, six years ago, <laughs> to the day, um, we arrived on site to begin some uh, commissioning of this building, and we worked closely with the architects and the mechanical uh, team on on undertaking this uh, commissioning. So, for the for the local architects, for the local uh, mechanical guys. Um, this was a, a new building, uh, a new building format for them, new, a new type of design. So they, they were quite keen for us to come over and, and help them to undertake some of the some of the commissioning. So we arrived. I think I think it was a Friday night actually, and um, very keen to go and look at the building. So we uh, took a cab went straight down to the building, had a walk around. It looked very good. It was a lovely evening, a bit like last night was. Walked around the building. Um, pleased with how it looks, went to have a look at the inlet uh, dampers, stood around by the inlet dampers and felt a lovely cool breeze. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's pleasant. Until we realised the cool breeze was leaking out of the building. So we were standing by the dampers and that this cool breeze, obviously in mechanical cooling mode, height of summer, so the cleaning was being pressurised with cooled air and that cool air, that mechanical cooled air was leaking out into, into Illinois. Um, whoops, I have to go back. Yeah. So we asked them to close the dampers and that's what the closed dampers look like. Okay. Um, so yeah, some remedial work was, was required there. I also highlighted the windward and leeward um, dampers in the earlier slide, and the uh, control logic had, it was the opposite way around. There, they were opening the the um, they were opening the windward and closing the leeward, thinking that that would encourage more air into the space, and the uh, partitioning in the attic space, which um, uh, partitioning according to the dampers which dictated how much air got recirculated and how much air left. The control logic was, was wrong in that area there as well. So left, left unnoticed, that would have been absolutely catastrophic to 
for the um, for the energy credentials and the environmental performance of the building. And I don't I don't wish to be unfair on the design team. They run a learning curve. But what I do want to point out is this happens in the UK as well with UK design teams as well. There's, there's a real a real lack of understanding in terms of how these low energy buildings are intended to operate and how they're intended to be controlled and commissioned, etc. So it's still something still something we need to work on. Yeah. What's the greenery going to last the, the, the greenery? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, um, I don't think so. No. This is this is the inlet here. The smoke you can see is the smoke testing that we were carrying out. I, this is just grass growing so wild. Should so, grow there? Yeah. 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 I hadn't uh, I hadn't uh, given it a second thought beyond that. <laughs> Additional cooling effect there for the generation. You could, yes, yeah, yeah. If there's a bit more of it, yeah, you could do, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah. No one's ever picked that up before. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so actual performance data then. So the the this is in the four day fall period, um, what we call a swing period, where we're moving over um, from uh, passive from mechanical to passive, so we're in passive mode here, um, October the 3rd through October the 7th. So the black line here is the outside temperature going up to what, 82, a bit higher, uh, and then you can just about make out the orange and the blue here, which are the second and third, uh, fourth floor level temperature sensors. Nice example here of those two phenomena happening. We've reduced the peak temperature and we've shifted it off. We've, we've time shifted it off to the, uh, uh, to the right. So working very well here in, in, in passive cooling, passive cooling mode. Yeah. How much flows and ass do you say in each of these buildings that's available to the occupants view angle in the passive cooling mode? Yeah. How much flows and ass is available to the occupants view angle in the space? How much flows and ass is available to the occupants? Oh, right. Is it like the two, entire... times, two times the floor area or? Oh, right, OK. Uh, uh, um... Essentially, all of the ceiling and all of the walls, I haven't done the calculation in terms of what that is in floor area. It'd be interesting to do that. But um, yeah, all, all of the ceiling area is what we, is what we aim for. Um, the walls are less important because obviously the view factor is up towards the ceiling. And especially when you're sitting side by side, it's, it's making sure that the ceiling is cool. So yeah, a lot essentially, but I don't know, it's a, I can't quantify. Are we seeing a little creep of several successive hot days there? Was injured, you absolutely are. Yep, yep. This is a passively conditioned building, and eventually the elements will get the better of this building. And we flip over into mechanical mode. That is exactly what's happening. What's really noteworthy here is the diurnal swing was dropped here. So the nighttime temperatures aren't as, as, as good as these. Remember, nighttime cooling is so important to us. So here, we've got some fantastic nighttime cooling going on, this air coming in, whereas it's not so great over here. Oh, I'm getting some questions here, Jay. Sorry. Oh, it's, it's disappeared. Sorry. Should I be answering these questions as they pop up? <laughs> uh, normally at the end, but if someone asks Sorry, them, someone, yeah. So what is the extent of active mechanical controls that are being used to control the building, e.g. wind catcher dampers, potential automatic shading devices versus relying more on the envelope tightness and glazing system careful design? What is the extent of active mechanical controls? Um, what's it mean by that? Certainly there aren't any wind catcher. There certainly aren't any wind catchers uh, being used. So the the mechanical controls are um, exactly the exactly the, um, the same extent as we would use for a passively conditioned building. Um, but, but essentially, what we have here is is a fully a fully air conditioned fully air conditioned building on on the top of a passively passively uh, ventilated and cool building. So it's the same sort of controls as you get in a mechanical, in a mechanical building. And in terms of the dampers, the same sort of damp control 
that we get for the uh, Coventry University Library. Um, I'd be happy to take up, up that conversation afterwards and offline if I haven't answered that question. There seems to be quite a lot in that question. <laughs> Annual energy consumption then. So uh, looking at the two buildings I've, I've shown, so we've got the ASHRAE based case here against the Judson University actual performance on the top here. And what we're seeing, shock horror, is a 100% increase in the, in the heating and the gas consumption relative to the uh, base case. So, oops, uh, we've lost control again now because of, how do I, uh, <laughs> because we went into the, um, that's all the question, just to get over. So that 100% increase in heating, this is the cost of those leaky gas. So we can get that wrong and, and, and we have a lot of problems because natural ventilation has very large openings. You've got to respect that and, uh, and they have to be, they have to be airtight. Yeah. So that happens in the beginning of the cool buildings too. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> Let's stop doing it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not because it's actually built. I know. I mean, it, I think it's a, exacerbated in this building because the openings are so large. So yeah. leaky dampers on large. The larger the openings, the worse the problem. So it was a full year of energy before it got fixed, or was it fixed like halfway through? It was fixed about halfway through. Yeah, halfway. Yeah. Yeah. So the um, yeah. And here we've got reduction in the in the electricity uh, consumption because we we feel that the, the daylighting strategy for the building was so successful. Um, so having a daylight linked luminaires, we were able to dim those around the light wells and, and, uh, and therefore reduce the, the energy consumption of electricity. Coventry University Library, so that was the benchmark we were working to at the time um, and we showed about a 15-15% uh, uh, reduction in the in the energy consumption, again, due to the good daylighting strategy for that building. There's also some reduction in the in the gas, as you might expect, because of those good U values, uh, high insulation values, um, etc. I've just put the, the imperial units there at the bottom. Okay, so a summary of the consultancy work. Great things are possible in terms of low energy building design, stimulating architecture, uh, informative uh, simulation, low energy performance, so reductions of 15 to 20 percent we've been seeing, uh, still providing good thermal comfort, good indoor air quality, and um, hybrid strategies I think are something that require, um, that something that we should be considering. But beware the three C's as I call it. Um, not brave enough to call it cooks for the seas, but no. uh, control. Um, no point in designing a naturally ventilated building if it's not controlled appropriately. So that means appropriate set points, which may be different uh, depending on the season. Um, offering user control where appropriate. Fully actuated dampers. Second one is commissioning. Uh, test everything. Test it twice. Make sure that it's doing exactly what it should be doing. Um, and then there really should be some fine tuning that goes on for at least through 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 two seasons you know, to make sure that um, that um, the dampers are opening when they are intended to and to the extent at which they are intended to and fine tune that so if they're opening too wide too quickly then reduce that and tweak that over the, over, over a period of years and you will bring down the energy consumption that's what we did at Coventry University Library spent two years fine-tuning it and were able to drive the energy consumption down even, even further. Finally, the client. Does the client understand the intended operation of the building? Does the client understand where the air is intended to come from? What we don't want is book bookcases put in front of the supply, uh, louvers, uh, um, etc. Hand over documents, something we call soft landings. Are these, are these provided? Are they, are they clearly understood? And 
The reason, another reason why Coventry University Library was so successful was because the client was involved with the design decision. So we had the client around the table as the architect was drawing. We had the mechanical engineer around the table as we were drawing. So every, every decision that was made in terms of, well, these openings need to be bigger. Oh, well, yeah, but what is that going to do to my control and the, and the QA? Well, what's going to, what is that going to do to my costs? So we've got the clients around the table from, from day one, understanding why there are 20 stats and not 16 stats, etc. So they, they, un, they understand from day one what the design intention is. Right. In the last few minutes, then, I want to move on to current research. And uh, I talked about a couple of projects that I've been working on here. Um, this is another uh, naturally ventilated building, uh, also in the UK building, um, in the UK Midlands. This is the Garrick Theatre, a 500-seater naturally ventilated auditorium. Um, and one of the things we've been concerned about with these, with these um, naturally ventilated buildings is because they require large openings, we're concerned about the, the possibility of there being bi-directional flow. So air entering an outlet where it's intended to leave, etc. Um, so what we've been looking at is what we call transience and solution multiplicity. So when I did this uh, computational fluid dynamic simulation, I ran it in the steady state, i.e. I forced the software to find a steady state solution, which it did. And we've got the layer of warm air here, which is above head height and that drove six, seven air changes per hour as required. Fresh air came in at low level. It all worked, it all worked okay. But it doesn't pick up what might happen if you model it in a, in a dynamic, transient way. Um, and that's what we've been doing here with something called large eddy simulation, which is an advanced turbulence modeling technique, which, as the name suggests, large eddies, it, it models the the recirculation, the eddy currents in the air um, over over a time period in a transient way. We speeded this movie up a little bit, but what what we're trying this research is, is research underway, and what we're trying to what we're trying to identify here is whether these turbulent eddies can be responsible for switching the flow direction. So if, if I just have a look at this in a um, just in a steady state result. Okay, so we have a snapshot here of, of what's happening or, or, or um, a snapshot of what's predicted to happen here and you can see that unlike the steady state simulation on the top right here, we've got some, some asymmetry in terms, of the, in terms of the temperature distribution here and we've got some lower temperatures here relative to this stack here and the possibility that that might switch the airflow direction which is catastrophic for a natural, a natural ventilation solution where you're, where you're trying to bring the fresh air in at low level. If it's sub-zero outside, then we want this air in at low level where the heating elements are. We don't want that dumping in at, at high level there. Um, it is a very computationally intensive tool. So this simulation here was run uh, on our 1,956 core um, high performance computer at Loughborough and 60 processors for four days and we got 30 seconds worth of simulation. So whether this will find its way into the design office in the foreseeable future remains, remains a question for discussion. But in the meantime, it's, it's a plaything for us academics to explore its intention. Um, and the, uh, and the second and final project I want to talk about is work we've done on coupled CFD and thermal comfort modeling, whereby we have coupled model of a um, thermoregulated human being with a computational fluid dynamics program. So we've embedded model of human thermal comfort and physiology within, within the airflow, in the, within the airflow uh, software. Let's just have a look at this model then. This is a very detailed model of human thermal comfort, subdivided into 59 body parts. Uh, each body part is further subdivided. Um, so for example, here we've got a cross-section 
to the upper leg. <clears throat> you can see we've got bone there, muscle, fat, inner skin and outer skin. And this uh, so-called passive system models the heat transfer through the body. So depending on what the body's doing, how active it is, um, how much blood flow there is around the body, and what the outside air is doing around the body, then it will predict the heat transfer from the body core to the outside and vice versa. As a result of the state of the body, there is then an active system that sits behind this that then responds to the, the thermal condition, the thermal state of the, of the human. And it will either shiver or it will vary the blood flow to the skin surface or it will sweat or stop sweating or stop shivering. Okay? And all of that gets predicted within this model as well as, well, how comfortable is this on the seven-point Fanger scale? How, how comfortable is this person going to be on the seven-point Fanger scale? So that's the model that's embedded within, within, the, CFD, within the CFD code. A side-by-side -side comparison of, of this model then. So on the right-hand side is the mannequin where it's been coupled with the, with the thermal comfort model. On the left is where it hasn't been coupled and we've simply got a piece of geometry where we are imposing um, what you might call a traditional approach to modeling um, occupants in buildings whereby the occupant is giving off, is giving off 70 watts mm -hmm. each, 70 or 90 watts. And what we're seeing here then, because this, because this human being is being thermoregulated, then um, the, the thermoregulation system is trying to maintain the core body temperature, and as a result of that, we're getting um, a lower surface temperature in the coupled model relative to the uncoupled model. And we're seeing interesting things like fresh air flowing in around, around the feet. So this is a naturally ventilated classroom, sorry. So fresh air is coming in at low level, washing around the feet. We're seeing some effect of that cooling on the, um, around the feet at that point. Um, the, the paper I'm presenting next week, ASHRAE, is looking at the um, application of this uh, model to chill ceilings. So again, here's the, here's the uncoupled version, the coupled version, and then on the right-hand side here, we've got the uh, coupled tool with the chilled ceiling. So, we'll look at, so we can see the effect of that on the, on the torso as that body is facing the, is facing the chilled ceiling. Okay, um, we're now moving into uh, making the mannequin breathe, and this is what my PhD student Rayhan, sitting uh, just there, is working on. So, if you haven't noticed it already, these are nasal passages. This is a nose, two nostrils, a lot of detailed mesh around there, um, and the various parameters there used for modeling the, the uh, transient, the transient breathing. So there's a time period of two seconds over which the, there's an exhalation and then a slight pause and then, and then air, is, air is breathed in. Let's just have a look at that here. So this is the mannequin uh, positioned within a natural ventilation environment. So it's a low speed, a low speed environment. And what we're, what we're able to look at here is what happens to exhaled air as, as as it's exhaled, how it gets entrained into the plume around the, around the body, um, and, and, and um, how those contaminants get transported away, away from, the, from the breathing person. Um, we've got extensive labs at Loughborough, so we can, we can uh, undertake validation work. This is Victoria. She is a thermoregulated mannequin, but she also breathes, and that's what we were using her for in this case. Um, so these openings in her head here provide uh, ducting for air in and out into the, into the skull area, and then she'll breathe out through the mouth and then in through the nose. And we can vary the rate of that breathing and the, and the, and the depth of that breathing. We subjected her to some laser treatment um, so we've got some particle image velocimetry going on here on the right hand side whereby we've seeded the air with olive oil um, 
we illuminate that olive oil with high intensity laser and as a result of rapid repetition of that, we're able to look at the displacement of the air around the human body, providing us with some validation data for the, for the computational work here on the left hand side. This work is still in the way. We've got some concerns over the shape of the nasal passages within Victoria and they're not quite as accurate as we'd like them to be. So you can just make out the trajectory there is slightly different to the trajectory we've got there. So there, there's some, some um, limitations that we're having to, having to work around at the moment. Future work then, so using this breathing mannequin and thermoregulated mannequin, I'm interested in looking at person-to-person -person infection modeling. Um, in particular in healthcare buildings, in, in hospitals, and also CO2 distribution inside, inside offices, and in particular inside schools. Indoor air quality in schools and productivity in children is, a, uh, is an important topic, certainly in the UK. And there's some good work come out of the out of our researchers in this country as well in terms of linking CO2 levels with productivity. Lots of people I want to thank. I'm not going to go through this list, but uh, architects that I've worked with, former consultancy practices I've worked with, uh, my research students, m and &E engineers, etc. So I'd like to thank you all for your time this morning. Thank you, Malcolm, uh, for that presentation. I think we're going to do a, a short round of just opening up the floor to questions. Feel free to leave if you need to, but please fill out your evaluations. And if you haven't signed in, um, the sign sheets are over here. Please make sure you do that before leaving. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and just open up to, let's just say, about 10 minutes of uh, open questions, and then we'll just uh, cut it off there and have people come up and talk to them if you want to talk to them about something specifically. So I'll kick off the first question. Um, on the naturally ventilated buildings, do you see there being a lot of hybrid controls between trying to incorporate occupant engagement with the system, or is it usually fully automated or all run by, you know, manually by people? Is there any type of crossover that you see working well? That's crossover between manual and automatic control. Yes. Yeah, um, yep, that is a challenge. Um, I think um, I think it's all to do with the occupants understanding where the air is coming from. If they can orientate themselves within an office space, um, the other thing we can do is to give occupants control of of windows in such a way that it won't interfere with the ventilation of the other levels of the okay. so, so we can... Um, um, natural ventilation is... The, the ventilation flow rate ventilation is determined by the smallest opening size along that, along that flow path. So for example, what we might do in those stack-driven ventilation systems is to put the main control at the interface between the occupied space and the ventilation stack. So that opening becomes the smallest opening in the ventilation flow path. So even if the occupants open more windows, it's not going to to affect the ventilation flow rate uh, because the ventilation flow rate is determined based on the, based on the smallest opening in the flow path. So it's, it's difficult, it's a challenge, but it can be done without dismantling the whole and short circuiting the whole ventilation strategy. Can I get a follow-up on that? Yeah. So they open the window, and are they going to 